attendees are in listen only mode. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome, a very warm welcome to this webinar on district energy business models and financial structuring brought to you under the Global District Energy in Cities initiative led by UNEP, uh, UN Environment. Um, this whole uh, webinar is being hosted by ECLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, an international association of local governments and also a partner to this initiative. My name is Anna Marks. I am Senior Officer for Low Carbon Cities at the ECLE World Secretariat and once again a very warm welcome to you all. Uh, this is our agenda today, a very full and interesting agenda. Uh, we will begin with an introduction to business models for district energy uh, by uh, Benjamin Hickman uh, with UN Environment. Uh, we will also have the perspective from the private sector uh, with Alexis Goldberg uh, with NG Networks. We will also have um, some guidance regarding how to choose a business model for district energy and how to innovate uh, and aggregate to uh, obtain finance by Tanya Groth and Emma Ashcroft with Carbon Trust. We will have a presentation uh, by Marta Kesic inspector at the city of Warsaw regarding the privatization that enabled the renovation of the district heating system of the city. We will also have time for questions and answers and we encourage your active participation. And I'll wrap up, let's say, with a summary of the discussions and an, uh, a perspective regarding the key roles that the local governments can play uh, in supporting the development of viable district energy business models, uh, business cases and business model. Um, and last but not least, we would like to hear from you on a poll regarding your interest for upcoming activities. So I hope that this is uh, an agenda that uh, captures your interest and that you'll stay with us throughout the session. Uh, before handing over to Benjamin, to Ben, um, I would like just to quickly give you some information on how to make the best uh, of this session. Uh, so throughout the session you will be muted, uh, but at any point in time you can use uh, the questions panel um, to ask questions to the, the speakers. Uh, if you have um, specific comments or you need technical support, for example with your audio or others, uh, please use the chat box. Uh, my colleague Pedro Martins here also at the Clay World Secretariat will be giving us technical support throughout the session and he will keep, be keeping an eye on that. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Benjamin Hickman uh, with uh, UN Environment. Ben, over to you. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, well, it's good morning here from Paris. Um, and uh, thank you, Eclay, for organizing this webinar. Uh, my name is Benjamin Hickman. I uh, work on the District Energy and Cities Initiative at UN Environment. Um, and I'd like to give you a slight flavor of um, some of the activities we're doing um, in the different countries we're working in um, and how that presents different business model ideas. But uh, first, um, let me just make this, uh, make this known. We, we have a chapter in a publication we launched um, two years ago now, um, which covered business models um, that were identified from around the globe. And really, we'd we'd recommend people to to at least look at this because it can really show some uh, real life examples from different cities and some of the cities presented here today, um, and kind of show across uh, across the forty five cities in the book what the different best practices in selecting business models have been, um, and just some key findings from that. Um, just wait for it to load. Um, that even no matter what the business model that's being chosen in a in a city for district energy, um, what's always clear is that the local government is extremely important 
whether you have a completely privatized system or a public system in uh, alleviating the risks. Um, so district energy systems will only grow from these small starter networks with local government support. And so we see business models as very much uh, one part of the, the, uh, the solution cities need to be looking at, but also local policies and um, as well as uh, sort of regulations can really help to leverage finance in district energy. Um, that being said, at the same time, you've got private sector from around the world that have developed systems, um, some of the best, best systems in the world, and they can really bring into, um, into a city some expertise, which maybe, especially at the early stages, might not be there. Um, and they can also deliver the kind of upfront finance, which um, is a big problem in district energy development. You have a hugely capital intensive system and, and attracting finance um, uh, is, a, is a big part of um, project development. And so private sector can bring that in. Um, and what we've seen from around the world is actually you have a huge variety of business models. Um, with different levels of private sector and local government ownership and management. Um, so some business models you might just have the private sector managing the actual operation or it could be a um, well-established public utility that manages it um, as well as you might have different ownership structures ranging from fully owned by the city to fully privatized. Um, and another important finding is actually these can change over time. Um, for example, Toronto um, started off with a public utility and as it saw the need to sort of innovate and also uh, release some capital um, or attract capital into the system, they slowly sold off parts of the system um, into a sort of public-private model and eventually I believe now it's a private model um, and that's brought in the kind of um, investment needed to really expand the network do such innovative solutions as their like their deep lake water cooling, for example. Um, but the city government in Toronto is still playing a huge role in in um, in helping that 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 system to develop. So it's it's really um, uh, you have to look at it very holistically. Um, and we've also we've also identified from across the cities that the best business models really can incorporate the multiple benefits that district energy can provide. So if you're, if you're developing district energy because uh, you're trying to alleviate fuel poverty, um, this maybe is a, a sort of a, uh, the sort of business model you might be looking at would have some kind of public control over it, at least over some public control over tariff setting um, and some governments such as in Paris actually have, are able to adapt the tariffs applied uh, based on the, um, the different type of user and their, their pay, paying capability. So just to say that this is, um, this is important for some cities. Other cities, uh, you might have um, huge electricity uh, grid stress and being able to incorporate in the, to the business model the actual electricity utility um, can have huge upstream benefits. So Dubai, for example, operates a... a uh, a model which is part owned by the local electricity and water utility. Um, and so the upstream benefits of cutting uh, peak demand by 50% maybe are automatically incorporated into the business model of the electricity utility. And so these, these are certain things to think about. And um, I guess the main key finding I want to highlight is that there's just a huge variety. And it's um, something which hopefully we as the initiative can help to, to communicate is um, when you're first looking at developing a business model, what it, what is the um, what are the options available to you? Uh, can I skip a slide? Yeah, um, and this this is from the report, so um, you can find this uh, with more detail in the report. But this is just to say, like we kind of see it along a just to try to create a framework of how to look at business models. Um, so the risk appetite of the public sector, as well as the willingness to control or uh, be involved directly in the business model has a huge influence. Um, some countries, for example, we're working with Chile, maybe they don't have the uh, kind of culture of having the public sector investing and operating utilities. Some countries do, such as in uh, Sweden, for example. Um, and this, the level of financial return on investment, um, for example, I mentioned fuel poverty, 
um, if you're trying to really lower the tariffs that are going to the poorest sections of society, the actual return on investment might not be that high. And so that's, uh, that's where maybe um, you can have more of a public bus business model where uh, the public sector is able to accept um, sort of slower returns on their investment and also are able to leverage uh, lower interest rates than uh, maybe some private sector operators. Um, this is just to give some examples. Um, I won't go into these too much because I'm just wary of time, but um, for some, there's just such a huge range. Like in, in Denmark, you have lots of cooperative models where they're actually loaned, owned by uh, local stakeholders and they have their sort of tariffs controlled. And um, at, the, at the other end of the scale, you'll have uh, Toronto and Dubai, as I mentioned. Um, Vancouver, for example, to kick off district energy in their city, they developed a public utility, but they see the actual district energy as being um, something which can be developed by the private sector as well. So it's about a public utility that demonstrates commercial viability to promote uh, private sector investment in other systems. Um, so I mainly wanted to talk about actually some of the cities we're working with, um, just because we're working with seven countries around the world right now, uh, Chile, China, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Malaysia, Morocco, and Serbia. And they all got such different situations and it can kind of highlight the, um, the different business models that, that are being applied. So in Belgrade, uh, which is one of our pilot cities, we have uh, one of the largest networks in Europe with nearly three gigawatts of uh, heat capacity. And it's currently a completely publicly owned utility model. So the public sector has control over tariffs, has control over all of the investments, etc. But there's a huge need of uh, investment in the city. You've got a, a network which in many, many areas is in need of lots of refurbishment. Uh, the utility wants it to expand. It's currently connecting 50% of households, but think it should do more. Um, and it's also run mostly on imported natural gas. And, this is a problem for energy security, but also environmentally, the utility knows it can do better. Um, all of this has a huge amount of investment needed. They've identified at least uh, 380 million euros over the next 25 years, but this could even be more. Um, and so bringing that kind of investment into the city is uh, something which has been an ongoing discussion, but actually, um, now the now the city is considering moving ahead with its publicly owned utility model, but at the same time having innovative business models for certain parts of the network. So, uh, for example, they just had a, a waste incineration uh, developed in the city, which is developed under a public-private partnership. They've also got a huge, huge uh, power plant about 40 kilometers out of the city, which um, they're considering connecting. Um, and so that will have a different business model, that sort of transmission line into the city. Um, another example, uh, of course, is China. China has a huge amount of district heating and is actually very innovative on district heating. Um, they have uh, enough waste heat, um, low-grade low waste heat, to, to heat approximately half of the, the heat district heating demand in northern China, which is a uh, huge, a huge amount. Um, they've already actually managed to, most of the high-grade excess heat they've managed to utilize. I think about 55% of all waste heat is currently used, but there's still a huge amount left. Um, currently in cities, you have city-owned utilities uh, and private utilities, but they're all very vertically integrated, so providing uh, heat, but also supplying heat, distributing heat, doing just like a vertically integrated utility. So. Um, for a third party to come in and provide waste heat into the system, it's not necessarily very open and not very easy for them to um, sell their waste heat. So there are several business models which uh, are being assessed, and this is an ongoing work which um, we are working with China on, but China also working on it with other organizations like the IEA. Um, so considering whether whether there's sort of rules created to allow this third party access into the utility model or whether the actual these vertically integrated utilities should be split up so that generation is separate from uh, transmission and distribution allowing heat competition 
um, which has been seen in other markets, um, or actually having an ESCO um, deliver the, um, the necessary investment in a connection to waste heat um, and um, with an energy performance contract. So these three models, there are also others, um, and I'll just actually show you on the right-hand side of the screen is um, the city of Anshan, which you can, this is just to, to show they have, uh, I think they have over 40 district heating uh, utilities in the city, huge amount of waste heat as well, this Angang steel that has about a gigawatt of waste heat that it could provide, and um, there's just no access into this market, A, because you've got a lot of uh, lack of interconnection of all the different utilities, but no central um, no central rules on how the, the waste heat should be sold into the into the system. So it's this is a problem which uh, needs addressing and is and is part of the work stream that we're doing in China. Um, another example we're working with Chile. Um, Chile has almost no district heating, uh, but has huge need um, in the south of the country to uh, develop sustainable heating, mostly because they have huge amount of uh, wood stove use. Um, which is, I think, one of the cities in the south of Chile has the, um, the is one of the most is the most polluted in Latin America. So huge amounts of uh, uh, pollution needs a kind of uh, a new response to heating away from wood stoves, and we're working with them to look at different options, including uh, district heating, but also heat pumps and uh, and efficient wood stoves and building efficiency. Uh, but I like this example. This is in Temuco, one of the cities in the south. You've got a private water utility. Uh, Chile is a very liberalised country, we could say, um, that has just identified district heating as another uh, commercial opportunity. Um, it's, it wants to help the local community, but also it's got experience selling services already to buildings. And so, just to test uh, sort of commercial viability and test how to actually deliver a project, they've started a small pilot to sort of learn from what the costs are. Uh, how to structure like uh, selling heat to buildings and hot water, and it's small, but it's uh, for Chile. This is a this is a really important project, and it's and it's getting showcased nationally. Just because if a water utility can do this, a private water utility can do this, then lots of other uh, uh, stakeholders could. And the lessons from it are really important. And uh, through their through the solution they selected, uh, they were able to reduce the gas consumption by ninety percent. Uh, that's by providing hot water and heat. Um, and then finally, uh, we've just had a workshop in Malaysia where um, partners like Carbon Trust uh, came and presented. But one of the really interesting outcomes came from uh, a local uh, subsidiary of the um, National Electricity System, uh, which is called TNB Engineering Corporation. And there, there is some district cooling in Malaysia, but there isn't loads and this is a really interesting model because it's all about incorporating the benefits um, as you can see on the left hand side the uh, sort of pink violet line shows what a normal cooling load would be and with the district cooling with thermal energy storage the red line shows what the uh, the electricity demand would be now so you have this huge reduction which may be about 50 percent in in peak demand and uh, this huge benefit to, to the national electricity uh, utility um, so what this subsidiary has done is actually started working in the district cooling field um, and uh, it's essentially investing equity into uh, special purpose vehicles um, alongside the building developer. So it's bringing in both parties, the sort of utility but also the building developer. Um, so both of those are benefiting, and both of those have got uh, some capital they can put into the project. Um, and it's they've they've developed several projects in Malaysia, and it's and it's it's like the Dubai case I mentioned earlier. There's a huge potential for this kind of model of having uh, utilities involved. Um, and yeah, like I said, it shares the risks and shares the benefits. Um, and it's though it's early stages, it's something which could definitely be scaled up in the country. And this uh, this subsidiary is also able to bring in the experience it's got from other district cooling projects it's done, which I think is very important in a very early stage market having that experience um, available um, and that yeah I think I probably overspoke but uh, 
thanks very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions on these cities or on the 45 cities, uh, we're very welcome. Uh, we'd, we'd really welcome uh, questions. And the website's shown at the bottom right of the screen and, and our emails. And um, if cities would like to also uh, sign up to the initiative and have more access to this kind of material, um, please just drop us an email and uh, we'd, we'd follow up with you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ben, for that excellent overview of the complexity, diversity of uh, business models that we can have regarding district energy. Uh, I would now like to hand over to Alexis Goldberg, a Deputy Sales Manager with NG Networks. Okay. Um, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just waiting for the presentation to show. and. Uh, I will uh, make a presentation from uh, the private sector. Um, just waiting for the presentation. It's coming. I believe uh, the slide is now showing. Um, I would appreciate if uh, uh, my colleague Pedro could confirm. It's good to go. Yes, okay. okay. Thanks, Pedro. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Um, well, uh, I will show you, I will introduce you our, our what is our core business in uh, NG Networks, which is a subsidiary of, uh, of NG. We can move to the next slide. Um, just to have you some uh, some key figures about uh, what is district heating, cooling in, uh, at NG. Uh, DHC activities. We operate uh, more than 250 networks internationally for 1.7 billion turnovers uh, with uh, 2,000 employees and uh, our target, our main target uh, by 2018 is to uh, have more than 50% of uh, renewal in uh, all of our networks. So we're uh, daily working on it. Um, in our business model, in order to uh, to 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 help the territories to make their fuel switch uh, in their district heating and uh, and cool, we can move to the next slide. And the next one. So, um, if we focus uh, on our activity in district uh, cooling, uh, which is which is one of the solution for for sustainable cities um, we have a figure that uh, cooling is set to to expand over than 625 percent by 2050 uh, like in Asia or Latin America you can uh, just have the uh, the, the figures uh, right in this slide and then uh, we have the conviction, especially in France, and we we we, we can see and uh, every day that uh, there are um, moving uh, projects regarding how to uh, uh, reduce the the footprints and how to go uh, up to reduce uh, what is called um, different uh, forbidden uh, forbidden gas that we'll have uh, by using a cooling process. We can move to the next slide. Um, there you have a comparison uh, of performance with uh, with the standalone systems. Uh, we we can see that effectively we reduce uh, for more than fifty percent uh, our CO two uh, emission. Uh, what I was told just before is that we we will use by this solution less. Uh, usage of chemicals um, we will improve uh, also the energy efficiency and we will use uh, less electricity consumption the other uh, main target is also to reduce uh, heat locally uh, locally in the city by using standalone uh, process we can move to the next uh, slide and the next one. Now, if you focus uh, directly on uh, our activity of uh, district heating, well, 
everyone knows that there's a, a range of beneficial outcomes like uh, a reduction of CO2, uh, introduction of a renewable technology, and also, but it's not as well known, but it's reduced labor and maintenance costs uh, as compared as a standalone process. Uh, we can move to the other one. <coughs> yes. And um, this slide shows you how we integrate uh, um, more and more for what is called the fourth generation of uh, district heating and cooling how we integrate thermal grids now in, uh, in our process. And of course, uh, all this has to be financed. So I will, uh, I will just expose you how and in our French model, uh, we move to finance all these processes. So now that we're moving from uh, uh, third generation to fourth generation, you can see that um, we use very low temperature uh, uh, district heating in our in our process uh, with low grid losses. We also uh, managed to introduce smart energy uh, systems uh, with uh, all of kind of intelligent control and metering uh, with uh, our digitalization of our, uh, of our process and also um, um, direct heating linked to uh, district cooling. Then we can move to the other side. And the other one. Here you have uh, uh, what I was told, uh, the references of our uh, biggest uh, DHT uh, district heating. So we operate one in Canada, two in the United States. Uh, mainly, we have uh, our, all of our district heating are um, mainly in Europe, with uh, more than uh, 162 district heating in France. So I will make a focus of our business middle model in France, and you will understand how uh, the investments are being part of either of public or private uh, ownership. We can move to the other one. The other side. Okay, there's a, uh, just a focus on um, district cooling of uh, Siberia in Malaysia. So, uh, 2013, uh, NG Services, subsidiary of, of NG, uh, acquired 49% uh, of the shell of Megana, a company operating uh, the district cooling of uh, Siberia. Uh, so you can see you can have the figures uh, about the cooling capacity and the thermal storage and the connected uh, customers. Um, this this hands by more than 200,000 um, 200, euros saved uh, by improving the plant operation. So it has been a good operation for for Malaysia. We can move to um, the next one. So what is uh, interesting the audience, I guess, is a uh, view from the private sector. What, what are, uh, if we make a focus uh, in France, <coughs> what are the business models we use uh, to develop uh, district heating and cooling? Mainly uh, in France, we, um, we have to answer to uh, public tenders because uh, we can tell that more than 90% of the district heating are public uh, district heating. They're, this is a public ownership. The investment is owned by the municipality, but it is, is financed by the operator uh, in a concession contract. So uh, we have our incomes, uh, which are based on tariffs that uh, are based on variable and the uh, subtraction term. And um, of course, this is long-term contracts. Uh, those contracts are fixed uh, mainly between uh, 20 to, to 30 years. Uh, if we talk about, for example, um, district heating that are using geothermal process, uh, the investment uh, will be based on a 30 years uh, period. Uh, if we talk about biomass energy, it will be more keen to 
to get a 20-year contract. Um, so this is mainly uh, the, the type of contracts we operate. Uh, where you have uh, the local municipality, which is low chain, is, is, uh, is tender. Uh, you have to finance uh, dozens of uh, millions of investments for uh, 30 decades. And, um, and uh, at the term of the contract, everything gets back to uh, the municipality. Then you have for uh, less than 10% uh, of uh, the district heating we operate, private ownership. Uh, in this case, we finance all the process. We get our incomes uh, from the same structure as, uh, as above. It depends on a variable uh, term, tariff and the subscription tariff. But the thing is that uh, the customers, which is not the municipality, uh, but uh, local uh, local housing uh, industry or hospital, um, are keen to, to sign only short-term contracts. So the risk is uh, is high uh, indeed, but uh, we can only move to um, contracts that are between eight to, to ten years. Then what we uh, what is pointing out in, in France now it's it's kind of hybrid uh, hybrid uh, contracts where where you have design conception operation and maintenance on a short short term contract which is transformed uh, until uh, until five years in a public ownership. We also um, initiate. Uh, um, district heating from Greenfield uh, when we are moving to a private ownership of the process which can deliver for future uh, delegation concession and in this case we only provide the energy for the, the, the concession and and then the concession uh, lives its life with uh, operation and, and maintenance that's that's the that's the point now in the in the French market where you have mainly public ownership, a little bit of private ownership, and this kind of hybrid contract where you, if you want to create from Greenfield a, a district heating, you will, as we are in the private sector, financing uh, the first step of of this uh, history. Uh, by uh, financing the process and then uh, the m local uh, municipality is keen to buy the energy in a in a public uh, in a public tender uh, if you have a question do not hesitate to to post it on the on the chatter uh, you will get uh, my email address directly by uh, by Anna Marquez. Thanks to all for your attention, and I'll, uh, I'll let you know that I'm available for for your uh, further questions if you have. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, and it is uh, really wonderful to see uh, Angie's corporate leadership in this regard of setting the target uh, to reach 50% renewable energy sources in in the systems by. 2018. Um, yeah. That's that is indeed. Uh, thank you for sharing. I was not aware, and it is indeed very good to know. Um, Alexis, uh, as you are still going to to stay with us for a little while, yeah, I sure. first would like to invite the audience uh, to type uh, questions for Alexis because he will have to leave us around noon. So please take advantage of uh, of this opportunity. Um, while uh, while we do this, and before handing over to the next speaker, uh, to to Emma from Carbon Trust, um, just a quick question to you, Alexis. Uh, while uh, I still uh, have you here, um, mm -hmm. is um, um, what is the 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 duration of this process uh, regarding uh, uh, the the systems that are owned by the by the uh, public sector uh, from the public tendering 
uh, until the, the the process is completed with the negotiation and signature of the contract. Well, from your experience, yeah. how long does it's, it take? It's, it's a it's a really good question. It, it, it takes uh, unfortunately it, it takes uh, a, a lot of time between the um, between the only uh, idea of uh, the feasibility of, of uh, district heating until we deliver the first megawatt to Howard, uh, sometimes it gets up to five to eight years between uh, the, the, the only project. Uh, the way that uh, the, the decisions that, that have to, to, to lead the local uh, municipality, the tender itself, and then the conception and the design of the district heating. Sometimes it's faster. It's really faster when you when you go uh, to a private ownership, of course, because you take all the risk. Uh, you you have to to chase the customers. Um, so sometimes it takes uh, between one to to three uh, or four years in order to deliver the first megawatt for house. But that's mainly uh, the time it takes uh, in, in France. To, to get a new district heading. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thanks for that. I, I will have more questions for you if you don't mind. <laughs> but uh, for now, thank you. I would like to hand over then to Emma and to Tanya uh, for the next presentation and again invite the, the participants in the webinar to, uh, to ask their questions through the questions section uh, on your interface. Um, Emma, over to you. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, give a quick answer regarding a question that already came through the to the questions panel, uh, the presentations will be made available. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um, can you can you hear me now? Right. Um, I don't know. I'm not receiving a notification saying that you've handed the screen over to me. I think I might be now. My computer just logged me. Ah, I can see now. Thank you. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, and thanks to UN Environment Anna Clay for inviting us to, to talk this morning. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning from London. I'm here with my um, colleague, Tanya Groth, and my name is Emma Ashcroft. Um, my, my colleague, Nicole Salmiri, is also uh, dialing in as a participant. We're all from an organization called the Carbon Trust. Um, we're based in London in the cities and regions team at Carbon Trust. Um, we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, we, we provide expert advice on, on um, climate change and green growth, and we focus on the development of district energy projects. So, um, oh, slide, is it moving? Oh, here we go. Um, right, so we've previously heard about the three basic business models that can be used to develop district energy projects. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about the considerations that you should make when selecting an appropriate business model for your project. Some markets across the world fully mandate that district heating or cooling should be used, and, and in these instances, there might be less flexibility over the eventual delivery vehicle for your project. Um, however, in the majority of cases, there is a need to build a robust business case for your project, part of which includes selecting your preferred business model. In considering um, the most appropriate model for your project, it's definitely important to think about the project sponsor's attitude to risk and their desire for control. You can look at, for example, developing quanti qualitative and quantitative evaluation criteria with um, the appropriate weightings. For example, um, you might have a quantitative uh, criteria such as the impact of the business model on the project IRR, or you might look at a qualitative criteria such as the impact of the project and the business model on the um, ability to deliver on your intended objectives. So these criteria can be used to evaluate um, which is your preferred business model. In considering this, it's important to think about yeah, the attitude to risk, the desire for control. Most organizations wish to minimize their exposure to risk, um, but as a general rule, um, risk should be assigned to the parties that are best able to manage it. If you seek to transfer it to a third party, 
this will usually have financial implications. At the same time, public sector bodies can accept a lower internal rate of return than the private sector. Um, and in the event that a public sector body is seeking private investment for a project that doesn't meet the hurdle rate for the private sector, they'll likely seek a capital contribution from the public sector to bring the project to an investable level. The public sector can also ac access a lower cost of capital with access to lower interest rates compared with the private sector. And then underpinning all of this is the ability and the appetite of the project sponsor to retain control over the future direction of the project. Um, so in order to safeguard the delivery of the intended objectives, you, you need to be able to consider how much control you have over them. So depending on what your drivers are, this might be easier or harder to do in the transfer of the project to the private sector. So, for example, if your key objective is carbon reduction, then it, it can be easier to specify the technology which is used during the procurement phase and therefore safeguard this benefit when you're transferring the project over to the private sector. However, in contrast, if your key objective is delivering fuel cost reductions to vulnerable customers, then your ability to control this will be reduced if the project is transferred to the private sector, which has a higher cost of capital and can only accept a high return on capital, therefore driving um, the eventual prices upwards. So in selecting the preferred business model, you must consider the balance between the desire for control, the appetite for risk, and the, um, the cost of capital and access to capital. Whilst continually linking this back to what your uh, intended objectives are for the project and the ability to deliver on those through the different and various business models. So, so this diagram just, show, just shows that in, in a wholly public sector model, you would have a, an appetite for control, a willingness to accept risk, and you can accept a low return on capital. A project such as a wholly public sector model could be financed with cash um, and municipal debt and you can then contra um, contractually offset the risk. In contrast, in a wholly private model, the public sector has a low appetite for control and unwillingness to accept risk. And in this instance, you can procure for a private company, perhaps limited by shares, to own and operate a scheme. This isn't a risk-free option because you'll usually need to guarantee heat offtake loads um, and the private sector will seek a high return on capital. So if they cannot achieve that through the project alone, they might seek a capital contribution from the public sector. You could consider a concession arrangement, for example, where the assets are returned to the public sector at the end of a contract term. In the middle of this, there's a range of a series of different hybrid models that you could explore. So, for example, an external special purpose vehicle, which is wholly owned by the local authority. In this instance, the local authority would underwrite the risk of the external SPV. Uh, and the advantage here is that you would have a more focused management um, on, on the project and can use blended municipal and commercial debt. In this instance, again, you would seek to contractually offset risk through um, passing over elements of the project to the private sector. Um, other examples of hybrid models include a, a joint public-private venture or a joint venture. Um, in this instance, you would share risk with the private sector, uh, perhaps through a part-owned company, which is limited by shares, um, and you could be financing that project through a mix of municipal and commercial debt and potentially also equity, where the public sector might donate land, for example, for an energy centre and, and therefore take a share of, of the project, which relates to that value. Um, the, the advantage of this model is that you can obviously share the risk between parties, um, but, but equally you need to be you know, sufficiently prepared when it comes to negotiation of, of the terms of this, of this joint venture um, as each party seeks to transfer risk over the table. So as this graph demonstrates, there's a variety of business models available to you and, and, and they differ according to who has control between the public and the private sector versus who bears the risk. So for example, um, on one end of the scale, a public sector led scheme, which is directly owned and operated by the public sector, is a scheme where the public sector has the most control and the least amount of risk. In contrast, a scheme on the other end of the scale with private sector ownership but only public sector facilitation um, is a scheme where the public sector has the least amount of control and the least amount of risk as this is transferred over to the private sector. 
There are also a range of pr procurement options, such as design, bid, build, where you have separate entities for the design and construction of the project, um, design and build, where you contract with one party to, to undertake the design and, and construction of the project. Um, you have design, build, operate, maintain, where again you contract with one party to design and construct pro the project and then um, operate and maintain it once it's commissioned. You can have a, a, a design, build, finance, operate, maintain scheme where you would um, seek the uh, third party to also finance the project and invest. And then also you can look for a build, own, operate um, scheme where you pass it completely, the ownership of it completely out to the private sector. So as you contract out more of the elements of the project to the private sector, you're increasing obviously the third party involvement and, and also increasing the risk that is transferred out um, to a different party. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Tanya who will talk a little bit about how you can innovate um, through potential aggregator models. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so I'm going to talk about an ongoing research project we're conducting on behalf of uh, Climate Kick. Uh, they've given us some funding to investigate design options for an aggregator with the uh, intent to leverage more low-cost private sector financing into distributed generation projects. Um, we've chosen to conduct a deep dive of the heat network sector across the UK due to uh, time constraints. Um, but in the UK uh, specifically, it's, it's quite interesting at the moment because both the central government and the Scottish government have set ambitious targets to boost investment into heat networks specifically. Uh, our work is currently nearing the end of the first of two phases and we are analyzing outputs of interviews conducted with key stakeholders from across the UK heat network industry. And the table that you can see in this slide, and I apologize in advance for the amount of words in it, um, it represents some of the key constraints identified by industry stakeholders allocated across the central government, local authority, energy industry, uh, or investors, depending on where the responsibility sits. Now, none of these are really surprising to us. Uh, we were expecting to see similar uh, similar constraints kept, uh, pop up in the conversations that we were having with all stakeholders, but I think it's worth noting that um, if you're looking at a wholly public or a wholly private sector financed uh, distributed generation project, which we've, we've spoken about uh, or some of the other panelists have spoken about previously, you can see that the constraints that have been identified, they actually stretch across the industry. And there is a disproportionate amount which sits within local authority and energy industry, and it's worth thinking about how these can be addressed by other players in the market as well. Um, we've initially identified uh, four different potential aggregator business models, uh, which we're taking back out to industry in the phase two of our research, which is going to kick off in a couple of weeks. Um, aggregators here can consist of both equity and loan financing, any combination of those two. Um, but just to briefly run through them, uh, the PIPECO model in the top left-hand corner refers to splitting up the investment into the pipe network or the transmission network of a distributed generation asset, bundling the investment into this specific part of the asset across multiple projects. Um, reasons for doing that is that this asset tends to be very similar across different, so for example, for a heat network, the pipes tend to be very similar from one project to another. So so there's a lot of consistency across the asset design and the technical elements uh, and also in, the, in terms of longevity of the asset. An alternate option is to look at an asset co-model, which operates on a similar principle, but where you also uh, include the energy generation asset along with the transmission network. The, you still keep the metering and billing, so the retail part separate, um, but it um, this specific model actually mimics a lot of the models we've seen come out of the deregulation of the Scottish water industry since uh, 2008 where um, um, the um, water providers um, are no longer are allowed to have both the, um, the, the water production unit, if you like, the wholesale unit, and the retail arm. Um, so it is something we've seen across in, in other similar industries, but not, not as frequently in the energy industry. Uh, if we skip to the next slide down, the regional framework, um, 
the framework approach kind of shifts from a purely financial aggregator, which is which is what the PipeGo and ASICO in reality are, to a combination of finance and technical support. And it's ideal for public-private part partnerships where there's a significant capacity gap in some of the parties involved. For example, we know in the UK that local authorities um, are very constrained in terms of uh, internal resources. They just don't have the capacity anymore due to, to budget uh, cuts to develop um, the necessary understanding, uh, technical and financial understanding needed for some of these investments. Similar, similarly, we also see technical skills gaps in investor partners um, who might not, particularly if they're considering entering a new market for them might not have in-house technical understanding of the projects that they're investing in, which makes them more risk averse um, um, by default. So a regional framework, what it does is it would set up a partnership across three parties to help develop and deliver schemes. So you have financial stakeholders, public sector developers, and technical delivery partners. Um, and the advantage of this is that you cut down on a lot of the um, common issues that you see in coordination between parties. If they're all together and they're united around a common goal, they're less likely to be communication issues and they're less likely to be misunderstanding through the, uh, misunderstandings throughout the project process. It also allows for greater standardization across the technical delivery. It increases um, capacity in all the uh, all the different participants and so reduces skills gaps. Um, of course, it creates um, upfront, you have a large, um, you have a large upfront cost in terms of contract negotiation because you have to get, and also in terms of finding the partners that you can unite with uh, in, in, in terms of delivering something you all are in agreement on. Um, also, you do see, as my colleague Emma was pointing out, there, there are different drivers, um, both from one local authority to another, but also um, from, from one industry stakeholder to another. Um, and um, I'm not going to show you the image for the national framework, but it's, it operates in a similar way to the regional framework. The main advantage of the national framework relative to the regional one is scale. We, we often come back to issues with scale, so if you're looking at citywide distribution projects, you should the the uh, the scale needed in an aggregator model to attract an investment community is typically um, around a hundred million leveraged in a hundred million pounds sorry um, leveraged into the industry and I apologize in advance that I didn't translate that into U.S. dollars and euros beforehand. Um, I just want to I mean I want to end at that note. Um, uh, we would be really grateful if um, or we please do get in touch rather if you would like access to any of the finished research that we're working on at the moment for business models and business model aggregators um, and also I should mention that uh, Emma's work uh, Emma and, and her colleagues have been working on stakeholder engagement guidance which is also going to be forthcoming in the next couple of months so if any of you would um, like access to any of these publications or feel that you can feed into some of the research that we're doing we'd be very very interested in hearing from you so thank you Thank you very much, uh, Tanya and Emma. That was indeed very interesting. And uh, I have to ask you already a question. I hope you don't mind, even before handing over to Marta. Um, I understand, of course, you are developing the concepts and still in a, a stage of, uh, of the conceptualization, but uh, do you already have plans regarding uh, implementation and testing of these different concepts, of these different That's models? Thanks, Anna. Yeah, no, that's actually a great question. So, phase two of the research project, um, and and part of the uh, as part of the funding we've received from Climate Kick. So, we're, we've got these four skeleton models, and what we're going to do is we're going to be hosting roundtable sessions and further interviews, and trying to identify one or two. Um, where there are sufficient partners in the industry who would be interested in taking this forward. Um, we, in uh, for this project, I mean, we are um, catalysts, or actually, at the moment, we were just talking about how we feel more like a dating service, so we're, we're arranging matchmaking sessions between interested parties who um, have shared drivers and who can see an advantage in taking this forward um, on their own um, um, uh, across the different uh, stakeholders, uh, so different market segments, if you will. So that's the next stage. So we'll we're hoping to see something uh, develop more fleshed out over the summer. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, of course, uh, ECLA is interested to, to um, uh, have more information as you go through uh, and explore 
possible cooperation there as well. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, so I would now like to hand over to Marta Kesic, um, Inspector uh, at the City of uh, Warsaw. Um, let me check. Hey, hello. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Marta. Uh, okay, hello. I hope you are here. Uh, you hear me well. Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, great. And I hope you see my screen right now. Yes, yes, we okay. see it. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Marta Kenzik, and I work for the infrastructure department in the Warsaw City Hall. And uh, I would like to say a few words about the process of privatization of our district heating um, network uh, in the city of uh, in the city of Warsaw. But in the beginning, just a few words about the uh, about our city to uh, for you to have an idea uh, what what city we are. Uh, we have 1.7 million inhabitants in the uh, area of 517 uh, square uh, kilometers, and uh, every year budget expenditures of 3.5 billion uh, euro and. Uh, a pretty low unemployment uh, unemployment rate. Um, in terms of uh, heat so sources in the city of Warsaw, uh, mainly uh, we use district heating uh, that is uh, powered by uh, the heat and power is produced by combined heat and power plants. Uh, the two biggest ones are uh, Shekielki and Zerań and they are now, uh, the fuel that you, we use in them is coal, but uh, Zerań uh, will be switched to uh, gas uh, in in following years. Uh, also, in the district heating system, uh, we have two uh, heat plants, uh, Vola and Cavention, that uh, are used during uh, low temperatures in, uh, in winter. Uh, also, the city has some local systems and local boilers that are uh, that are used in uh, the uh, in not not in the central areas of the uh, of the city, uh, and they are pretty pretty small uh, pretty small systems. In terms of uh, our district heating uh, network, uh, actually it is the third biggest district uh, heating network in the world after Moscow and Kiev, and uh, it covers over 70% of the uh, heat uh, needs uh, of Warsaw, Warsaw inhabitants. Uh, the length of the uh, system is 1,773 kilometers. And as I mentioned before, the uh, pretty big share of the of the heat, uh, 89%, is produced in uh, cogeneration in those two uh, heat and power plants. Uh, also, what is uh, good for energy efficiency is that uh, uh, over almost 50% of the heating network is uh, pre-insulated. And in terms of the development of the network, in uh, last few years we uh, have uh, been connecting uh, our our uh, social buildings to to the network, and uh, we have pretty big plans to connect more more than 200 buildings in uh, until 2020. And uh, the uh, privatization of our uh, district heating network uh, was uh, done in 2011, and actually the main purpose of, uh, of this transaction was to uh, obtain, uh, obtain financial resources uh, for the investments uh, that we have planned in the city, and these were mainly investments in uh, development of public transport system, uh, for example, uh, building of the second uh, metro line and uh, buying uh, new buses and new trams uh, for, for the city. Uh, and also the idea was to uh, obtain a stable partner who will provide uh, better standards of services and uh, will invest in, uh, invest in the development of our district heating network. And um, 
the city, uh, the municipal companies uh, was called SPEDS and 85% uh, of the shares uh, of SPEDS was sold uh, to Dalkia in 2011 for 0 0.35 billion euro and 15% of shares were provided to uh, employees of, uh, of the company uh, and it was uh, for free. And uh, what is uh, the most important thing for us, it was the, that uh, in the um, uh, contract, uh, we have made sure that uh, the investor will have some obligations and the most important of them were uh, to uh, invest uh, 250 million euros in next seven years. Uh, beginning uh, uh, from 2011 and 80% of this amount uh, was to be invested in district heating network and development and modernization uh, according to uh, the list of guaranteed uh, investments that were uh, proposed by the city. And uh, also the second uh, important thing was to uh, ensure that the investor will not sell uh, the shares in at least uh, 10 years. Uh, of course, to uh, be uh, to have stable partner uh, with uh, development plan for the district heating, net heating network. Uh, next thing was uh, to ensure that the offices of the company will stay in the city uh, in the city of Warsaw, and that also that of course means that the taxes will be paid to the to the city budget. And uh, the last thing is to follow the rules of cooperation in terms of energy safety policy and uh, Polish energy law. Um, there were some, um, uh, uh, there were a lot of positives of the privatization of the of the network. And uh, for sure, uh, we ensured that the, there will be a lot of investments in development and modernization of district heating network uh, according to the plan that I mentioned before. Uh, of course, we have a possibility to check if the investments are uh, and going according to the plan because uh, the investor is bound to prepare annual reports with information about the investments uh, already done to ensure that uh, the provisions of the contract are respected and those reports has to uh, have to be accepted by the mayor of Warsaw. Uh, also what is pretty important for us is that the global company that we cooperate with uh, is investing in new, in new intelligent technologies thanks to uh, its know-how and also uh, provides intense modernization and development of the district heating network uh, that ensures positive impact on environment and air quality. Uh, here we have uh, some examples of the investments that were made in last, uh, last years and uh, those are uh, liquidation of group district heating substations uh, in in more more than 100 buildings and uh, also uh, modernization of heating network for pre-insulated uh, also each year 12 kilometers of uh, new uh, heating network uh, is built and uh, the thing that I mentioned before, connection of social buildings to the central uh, heating network, that is pretty important for us uh, because a lot of uh, social buildings were uh, uh, had no possibility to to connect to the to the network. And um, as I mentioned, the uh, possibility to have a smart, intelligent. Uh, system is pretty important for us because it ensures uh, better services for, for citizens and uh, it means that uh, we have uh, uh, less impact for air quality and uh, uh, for air pollution and environment in the city and um, the project that uh, uh, is now developed is intelligent heating network. Uh, the main goal of it is to su 
support all processes that are related to eff efficiency uh, of the network operation and uh, district heating network uh, is now equipped uh, with measuring equipment and means of data transition and decision support application uh, that ensure optimum control of network operation uh, under uh, normal operating conditions and uh, when uh, we have some uh, emergencies uh, in the in the network and uh, what was uh, maybe uh, some negatives of the privatization were uh, of course that um, now uh, when the company is not municipal the city has no influence on uh, uh, many business decisions um, I mean uh, like development plans where, where the company uh, will, will have the priorities of, uh, of investment and acquiring uh, new customers. Uh, also uh, insights of the company um, which means organization structure, management of the company, human resources policy and uh, distributions of uh, profits. And that's actually it so thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm now available to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Marta. It's uh, really impressive uh, with the tremendous size of the district heating network in Warsaw. Uh, this was really a big feat to to indeed uh, do a substantial uh, retrofitting uh, of the network. It's really impressive. Marta, if you don't mind, I would like to actually ask a few questions to Alexis uh, that have come in in between. As he mentioned, he would have to leave early. But we will come back to you. We also have already at least one question here uh, already listed from the attendees. Mm -hmm. Alexis, are you still yes. with us? <laughs> yes, I'm still with you. I, I, I get that you can hear me. I was yes. just uh, I was just reading uh, one or two questions. Is, is it the question about the, uh, how we finance uh, internally or, or in partnerships um, uh, our project? Is it this question? Uh, yes, exactly. Maybe let's uh, uh, le uh, exactly. So Tanya asks um, uh, how uh, NG uh, heat networks in France have been financed uh, fully internally or in partnership with either financial or public sector partners. Would you like to well, address ma mainly, it now? Ma ma mainly, we 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 usually um, finance uh, a part. Uh, uh, internally a part uh, of the investments uh, well it, it, it can be uh, uh, 10 up to 30 percent of the total of the investment and then we um, we, we have the help of uh, of course of uh, financial sector um, uh, either uh, private or, or public sector mainly mainly private and we also get uh, subventions from the government in order to finance, um, in order to finance the investment. So, uh, um, so that that's mainly how we uh, we uh, structure uh, the the financing of our project. Thank you very much, Alexis. There has been another question that is uh, for you as well from uh, a participant, uh, Stephen McDonald. Uh, mm -hmm. Stephen McDonald, I apologize. Uh, what are the technologies that you consider have the most potential to provide low carbon solutions for district heating in the future? And he mentions specifically, for example, mineral yeah. water heat if you think yeah, this is yeah yeah oh we, well well it's 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 a tremendous uh, opportunities uh, i would say uh, mainly uh, um, i would say that um, uh, using the waste heat from uh, incineration is a, is a, is a great opportunity uh, uh, the french government is uh, is giving a big subvention in order to to have a uh, uh, pipelines uh, connecting uh, from uh, over than uh, three to five kilometers a local city in order to get this uh, renewable um, energy, but also heat from uh, wastewater, uh, and uh, and a new one is is uh, at at uh, uh, maybe at a tiny scale, but uh, heat from uh, 
uh, recovering heat from a cooling process. Uh, so, so this is this is another opportunity uh, we can we can also mention uh, the biomass uh, and also um, new generation of biofuels. Uh, in France, we have the announcement of uh, of uh, those new types of uh, energy that uh, will be uh, uh, will be uh, used. But also, uh, we can uh, we can uh, mention the biogas and the opportunity to uh, use it uh, uh, with cogeneration uh, if the resource uh, is uh, is enough. And um, I would also mention uh, geothermy. If uh, you have the resources, uh, I think that uh, this is this is also another opportunity. Just to say that th th there's a very la large scale of um, recovering uh, either uh, local resources or uh, resources from uh, industrial process. Is it, is it clear? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Alexis. Uh, indeed, uh, there's a lot of room uh, uh, to increase the share of renewable energy in district yeah. energy systems, and it was great to get that overview of the resources with the with large potential, uh, generally speaking. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yeah. Alexis, if you can stay with us, please do. Otherwise, the questions that I have here in the questions panel are addressed to other speakers. So uh, feel free. It's up to you. I, I would now like to, to return. Uh, of course, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexis, for your participation. And we'll follow up by email, OK? Um, yeah. I would like to, to return uh, to Marta now. Uh, there are two questions here in the panel which I believe I addressed to you. Um, so uh, the first one comes from uh, Stephen McDonald as well. Um, and he asks if moving away from fossil fuel district heating, uh, how will this impact upon income generation if electricity generation from uh, combined heat and power is reduced? And I don't know if this is if this can be stated uh, as the case. But uh, Marta, would you like to address this? Uh, could you could you repeat the question because I don't know if I understood it correctly. Because so I'll read it exactly as typed. Uh, if moving away from fossil fuel district heating, how will this impact upon income? If electricity generation from CHP is reduced. Mm -hmm. um, my answer would be that for now we actually don't have a plans of move, moving from f fossil fuel fuels to be used in our combined heat and power plants. I don't I don't think that it actually answers the question because I don't understand. <laughs> Perhaps I well. misunderstood, and uh, and this question was not addressed uh, specifically yeah. for you. I apologize, uh, Marta. Uh, what is uh, what are the energy sources used in the system in Warsaw? I understand natural gas is one of them, coal as well. Could you now, share a little bit on that? Now uh, the main energy source that is uh, used in those two biggest. Uh, combined heat and power uh, plants is coal, unfortunately. Uh, but in 2020, one uh, of those will be uh, switched to natural gas. So this means uh, maybe less CO2 emissions, but it's actually still not renewable uh, energy. And uh, I would say that we don't have uh, in next few years plans of uh, switching those big, big uh, plants uh, into uh, renewable energy, but rather we invest in uh, per local uh, renewable energy sources in a smaller scale like, for example, photovoltaics or uh, production of, of uh, also heat from, uh, from 
the uh, the sun, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's only it's only it's only this for uh, for for now. I don't think that uh, the uh, that we will have. Uh, like bigger, bigger investments in in following years. So we uh, we will probably stay with natural gas and coal for now. Mm -hmm. Very good. How about uh, uh, biomass co-firing? Co oh, co I apologize. Uh, in the coal power plants, has this been explored at uh, at some time? Yes, actually, actually, mm -hmm. it is explored, but it's. Mm, a bit of a small scale in uh, this uh, one of these uh, CHPs we have uh, actually biomass boiler but it's uh, mm, uh, it, it's uh, rather rather small uh, investment so uh, it is a part of our system but uh, uh, I think that due to some changes in uh, laws, it's not now something that that will be uh, like pretty big uh, thing for uh, for Poland and and for for Warsaw. So uh, we uh, yes we we have tried it. The, it is in uh, in the system in uh, in in Warsaw, but I don't think that there are some uh, plans to to build like bigger uh, to invest like in bigger in biomass uh, in those CHPs for now. Mm -hmm, understood. Um, Marta, I would like to come back actually to the key focus uh, on the presentation and uh, ask you regarding the process uh, on how it was possible to come to the agreement uh, with Veolia. Uh, did this, uh, was this partner selected through a competitive process and if so, um, how long did it take to prepare until the tender could actually be, uh, the call for tendering could actually be launched? And so uh, I have to say that I was not in the process, so those questions I would like to, I would have to check really because <clears throat> as far as I know it was quite a long process, but, uh, but uh, if uh, I would like to to tell like exact numbers or how the preparations went, I would uh, have to investigate a bit and and maybe maybe answer by uh, by email because yes, of course, the thank you. Day, I, I I don't know. Yes, of course, don't worry. Uh, there is a question here from a participant, Tanya Tanskanen. Uh, about the intelligent heating network uh, and she asks specifically about the data. Is the data kept private? Who owns the data? Uh, so the, those data are the data of the uh, private company Veolia. Uh, so uh, they use it to manage the, the system in uh, the best way possible. Uh, and if we like to have some of the data from them, uh, we probably should ask uh, if it's possible to obtain them uh, and maybe have some kind of agreement on uh, how the data will, will be used and uh, we, uh, what are the purposes of uh, using those data. So if that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very good. At this point in time, uh, I don't see additional questions uh, from our audience or from the other speakers. Uh, so the invitation remains uh, for uh, questions uh, to be brought up. In any case, at this point, I would then move forward. Um, this, this session today is the fourth session that uh, we deliver in this last six months. So it's the last, it's the fourth of a series. And in a way, the presentation that I would like to give now, it will be brief. And uh, the intention really is, uh, in a sense, to, to give an overview, to try to bring together the information. And 
a little bit focus on the different roles that the local governments can take throughout the different pro uh, steps of the process. So this links very well to a lot of the information that the previous speakers have shared. Um, and uh, it, uh, I would like to start with the business case. So for example, NG gave us um, a lot of the, the big numbers in comparing district energy systems with individual systems and uh, helping to make the business case. Of course, <coughs> excuse me, of course local governments can play an important role in strengthening the business case for district energy projects and uh, help um, in uh, strengthen the viability of the projects in particular and in long term, in a long term perspective. These different roles include, as has already been mentioned, for example, for by Carbon Trust and also by um, by UN Environment, engagement and coordination of stakeholders to bring them together in the development of the case uh, of the business case, uh, to themselves provide anchor loads to connect large buildings such as for example uh, city hall building uh, or schools or pools etc uh, that already uh, provides an important element um, for the viability of the project. The creation of demonstra demonstration projects uh, then has also given examples of this um, to, to demonstrate district energy at the local level to encourage the use of local renewable energy resources and we've seen this uh, for example throughout the series we saw the case of the city of Vancouver using um, heat recovery from raw wastewater we've seen the case of Banyaluka for example exploring the possibility to use biomass and geothermal energy and uh, uh, this of course links very well with the necessity to integrate district energy and to make the most of the renewable energy potentials to integrate this into the process of developing local energy strategies and master planning. With this the local government can also create um, a favorable policy regulatory and administrative framework uh, not just in terms of uh, making the process uh, more expedited for example to obtain the rights of way but also in terms of creating incentives uh, to connect uh, to the district energy which is valid even in cases uh, where we have a liberalized energy market uh, where it's not possible to mandate to require to mandatory connection but it's possible to to create incentives incentives uh, like for example um, density bon uh, bonuses or uh, tax exemptions and this already takes us to the next bullet here regarding the facilitation of finance the tax taxation aspect can be a component of it but we already saw different examples mentioned in this case relating to leveraging uh, the local government's own assets uh, but also facilitating access to finance by having because of a lower a lower cost uh, of capital to the public entities and so on and an aspect that I don't recall that has been mentioned in this session yet but that has been mentioned in previous webinars has been for example the setting of targets and this is the case for example uh, of London uh, where the former mayor had set a target of 25% uh, of the energy uh, being generated uh, locally by 2025. So these are a few examples of how local governments can really contribute to strengthen uh, the business case for district energy. Uh, and linking to today's session, we've already had uh, a lot of information shared by our previous speakers and uh, the key aspects have been uh, brought up what are the key objectives of the, the project, what are the levels of financial return, what is the degree of control that the local government wishes to exert, uh, how much risk is it willing to take and this will of course uh, condition the constellation uh, and uh, in terms of ownership and, and the partners that are brought up brought into the to the model. Uh, of course the legal requirements uh, are also very important and can condition the approach such as 
is for the example the case in Denmark where the energy utilities are non-profit and uh, um, throughout these different models so from the holy uh, holy public a business model to the private uh, there are different mod models in between different hybrid models in between that can be mentioned uh, the they have been mapped quite extensively uh, previously. I would just like to mention briefly regarding the roles that the local government can take. For example, it's very frequent in the case of uh, community-owned non-profit energy utilities, um, which has already been mentioned, the fact that uh, very often the local government provides guarantees um, and the rights to finance. Um, it can also support in different ways, like, for example, giving access to revolving fund, providing grants, etc. Even in, when uh, we are talking about a private business model, uh, the local government can also take very important roles. And uh, I recall that either Emma or Tanya have mentioned this before, for example, by guaranteeing the demand. Uh, but also, again, through the planning regulations to encourage connection, to incentivize connection. But also even uh, in helping putting, uh, putting together a project preparation facility and pipeline, such as is the case, for example, of the Greater London Authority uh, that used um, used a grant from uh, the ELENA European project, uh, European program uh, to do this and leverage private sector investment. So uh, throughout these, uh, these diff very different options and we've seen that there are indeed um, a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities depending on the local context. Um, the local government of course plays an important role regarding procurement and the, the, a competitive procurement process can really help in uh, bringing together, identifying the, uh, the contractors that have a proven tra track record and capacity for delivery and providing um, value for best value for money. I won't go into the details, of course. Um, I would also like to mention briefly the business development process, uh, which actually starts even before procurement um, regarding, for example, the securing of commitments from potential customers to, to indeed make it possible, make it viable um, to move forward with the project. And indeed, the, the, the roles uh, that can be uh, played here by the utility uh, are multiple. I, once again, I won't go into the details because of the time. Here's where I was uh, uh, aiming to get at. Uh, additional guidance is available online thanks to this partnership uh, between UN Environment, ECLAY and many other organizations in the initiative that have been participating such as Carbon Trust and NG, but also thanks uh, to the contributions from cities in the initiatives in the initiatives such as Warsaw and London, um, Vancouver, Gothenburg and many others that indeed have been sharing uh, their experiences and expertise in this field. So um, this is an invitation to all the local governments uh, participating in this webinar to join the initiative and to register and log in in the Solutions Gateway so that you can gain full access to the guidance available there and to the resources uh, that are available. Uh, we already have five solutions on district energy available online and we are in the process of finalizing the six that should be going online in May. Uh, one final comment or uh, invitation, let's say a final challenge to the local governments in the audience uh, to invite you to report uh, your actions and uh, your targets regarding district energy. Uh, ECLAIM manages a global uh, global climate and energy database for local governments. This is, of course, free of charge, uh, cost-free, just as the Solutions Gateway. It's available for use. And the purpose of this um, platform is to contribute to the transparency, visibility, and recognition, and hopefully also open doors to additional uh, financing. So the transparency uh, here is, uh, is indeed an important uh, aspect, and we're trying to um, 
to gather the information and to use in advocacy process. For example, in the UNFCCC um, climate, global climate negotiations. Uh, so this was what I had to show you. I would now like to move to the last item in the agenda which was relating to upcoming events. I would like to ask my colleague Pedro for assistance and would like to invite you to answer a poll. Pedro, if you can hear me, yes, I would I'm appreciate it. <laughs> Just a second. Oh, thank <laughs> you very much. Uh, so the, the purpose here, uh, the purpose with this poll is uh, to hear from you. Uh, what are the topics that you would like to see in upcoming activities in terms of peer learning and exchange uh, between uh, cities, but also, of course, uh, in with exchange with experts from the private sector and non-governmental sector? Uh, while uh, while uh, uh, this uh, while Peter is working on making this poll available for us. I would like to once again uh, thank you all very much. Uh, thank you all the participants, uh, but especially thank you to the speakers uh, who have made themselves available and uh, of course to reiterate the desire to continue to, to explore how we can further cooperate and support each other in these efforts to advance modern district energy. Um, I would also uh, like uh, to... Uh, ah, okay, I see that the poll is now listed and... Okay, I will now click to launch it. So, you should now be able to see the poll on your screen. And I will give you just a few moments to be able to vote. Uh, uh, one important information. Of course, everyone is invited to, to vote, including the panelists, of course. One important information is that you can only select one option. This is a system limitation, so you'll only be able to identify your preferred, uh, your preferred option. Of course, uh, we very much uh, like to hear from you and uh, uh, feel free to use the questions, the chat, and of course, also to write to us by email. Uh, we, we very much uh, are very open and interested in exploring uh, cooperation. I see that about half of the people have voted, so let's give just a little more time in case additional people want to participate. Okay, I think we can close the poll. Uh, Peter, would it be possible to display the results on the screen? If not, that's fine. I can see the results here. Ah, okay, very good. Uh, so we see that uh, there's a tie, <laughs> a tie between uh, the integration of district energy in local energy a strategy and master planning, and the development of the business case, which includes, of course, uh, the feasibility, the financial modeling, um, and initial mapping uh, of risks. And here, that's the third option selected here regarding to risk analysis, mitigation and management. So thank you all for uh, your participation in the poll as well. This gives us a valuable uh, information. And with this, I would like uh, to come to the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, let me uh, ask the panelists if they would like to make any last uh, uh, remark. For example, Ben, would you like to to take the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for, for the feedback. Okay, so once again, thank you all very much, and we look forward to connecting with you in a future opportunity uh, regarding uh, modern district energy system. The, the, the recording of the webinar will be made available uh, shortly in our website, in our web page of the initiative, and it will be made available in the YouTube. 
So thank you all once again. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you to the participants. And don't hesitate to connect with us. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.